I've always said I don't start fights on social media, but I'm never afraid to finish them. Now, sir, if you'd be so kind as to give me your name before I run you through. Recently, Masters of the Universe has been all over the news thanks to the controversy swirling around Kevin Smith's new series, Masters of the Universe Revelations. My friends will tell you I have no love for Kevin Smith, so this outcome is of little surprise to me. I smoke a lot of weed, kids. What does surprise me, though, is how people don't seem to realize this isn't the first time Masters of the Universe has been hijacked by an egotistical writer of mediocre skill that wants to use the franchise for his own personal ambitions, rather than having any real investment in the mythology itself. I smoke a lot of weed, kids. Drugs don't make your problems go away. Sadly, we've seen this occur countless times in the past 15 years. It's the new pattern in entertainment. Rather than do justice to the legacy materials they've been handed, the new generation of self-absorbed creatives use these properties as vehicles to promote themselves, rather than bolster the stories they are given stewardship over. One need look no further than J.J. Abrams to see you can make a lucrative career out of this pattern in modern Hollywood. Corporations have endless boilerplate messaging about how they're going to protect the legacies of these culturally significant stories they've been entrusted with. But ultimately, they always do the same thing. Hand it off to a hired gun and get back on the phone to make that deal for a new yacht. And that's the best case scenario, that these things might be ending up this way because the executives aren't keeping an eye on things. More likely, in many cases, they are paying some attention to what these lunatics decide to do with the stories, and they're just cool with it. Because corporate executives really don't know how to make creative decisions anyway. I don't know what to do! I can't make decisions! I'm a president! An early adopter for this model of dysfunction within the entertainment industry existed long before Abrams touched Star Wars, or Zack Snyder was handed the keys to DC Comics. Heck, it was a year prior to Abrams' own Star Trek reboot. In 2008, Mattel launched the Masters of the Universe Classics line. It was a subscription-based action figure line of characters from the original He-Man toy line, but now done in a larger scale with better sculpting and more intricate articulation. The initial waves of these figures were sculpted by the Four Horsemen, the same artists that brought He-Man back in the mid-2000s with a new new range of reimagined action figures. Buyers had to subscribe to MaddieCollector.com to pre-order these toys year after year. Maddie Collector would go on to do a range of Ghostbusters toys, as well as a Lion Force Voltron that wasn't worth the sum of its parts. Whoever designed this at Mattel should fire themselves. If He-Man was so popular year after year, why wasn't Mattel offering these toys to retail? Because, by some accounts, the man behind the marketing of Maddie Collector had convinced the suits at Mattel that He-Man would never succeed at retail again. Allegedly, he also told them Ghostbusters wouldn't succeed at retail again either. If you don't think about it too much, it sounds perfectly plausible. However, when you consider this guy was making all the decisions at Maddie Collector, and anything made under the Maddie Collector umbrella was spearheaded by this one guy, it starts to feel less like sound logic and more like he didn't want anything to escape his purview. Because in the background, this guy was rewriting the entire mythology of He-Man, and he wasn't doing it because it was necessary or mandated. See, the Maddie Collector figures were selling themselves, almost exclusively to adult collectors who had rabid nostalgia for Masters of the Universe. These guys weren't asking for a reimagining of the mythology itself. They didn't need it to motivate them to buy the figures. They already loved the original stories the figures were based on. However, the Maddie Collector marketing guy took it upon himself to rewrite Eternia's entire history anyway. Rather than simply reprint the original mini-comics while creating a few new ones for previously unreleased characters, this guy wanted to bring everything together. He wanted the mini-comics continuity to mesh with the Filmation version, and the 2000s relaunch version, and roped in the kids' storybooks lore, and the 1987 movie, as well as rejected and unused ideas from Mattel's archives. This might sound like a noble pursuit, 
We've heard from Crystal Dynamics recently how they'd like to do something similar with Tomb Raider, to bring all the various eras of Lara Croft into one canonized mythology. But what the marketing guy at Maddie Collector was doing wasn't so cut and dry, and hardly with dispassionate intentions. As children, we knew there were unexplained differences between the mini-comics of He-Man and the Filmation cartoon. All of this was somewhat unconcerning for us at the time, because elements from the cartoon were given the same attention as Mattel's in-house ideas. Prince Adam and Orko were made for us to collect right alongside the Snake Men and all the other weird things that never made it into the TV show that were really cool figures anyway. And yeah, in the 2000s relaunch series, they started changing a bunch of things and adding to the storyline in overly complex ways typical of postmodern pop culture, where everyone has to be somebody and everything has to be a twist. Skeletor used to be Keldor. There was a King Greyskull who used to rule from Castle Greyskull and was also He-Man's ancestor or something, and placed his power inside the sword that Adam would one day wield. And in making King Greyskull the ancestor of He-Man, it invalidated the intended identity of He-Man's ancestor as a super wizard named He-Ro. This idea was established in 1987 at Mattel, but the toys were never made. But hey, they put a band-aid on that by getting Hero to marry into King Greyskull's royal family. So, problem solved, I guess? In Kevin Smith's Revelations TV series, Hero is now one of King Greyskull's two sons or something. All of this kind of shuffling is what a former co-worker and friend of mine called simplexity, taking something straightforward and appealing and ruining it with pointless additions that intend to make it more sophisticated and involved, but only succeed in confusing everything beyond the want to care anymore. And no one was more addicted to simplexity than the marketing manager at Matty Collector. In his world, Skeletor was not only once the man called Keldor, but he is also King Randor's brother and the power sword is now called the Sword of He. You heard me correctly, Sword of He. <laughs> Sounds pretty stupid, right? That's because it is. And this implies that She-Ra wields the Sword of She. Apparently, the Sword of He has been bestowed upon a lineage of manly protectors of Greyskull over the millennia. In a clunky bid to connect everything, as was his obsession, the marketing manager at Matty Collector named an early giveaway He-Man figure Woundar, and made him an early protector that wielded the Sword of He. <laughs> There was also a Conan-looking concept version of He-Man named Vicor that was roped in as another carrier of the Sword of He. <laughs> the mythology was starting to read like it had been written by a third grader who'd had 20 pixie sticks, a liter of coke, and half a chocolate cake. She brought the yellow cup that she didn't want to kick the ball back. And unsurprisingly, the entire effort was a do-over, another of the countless reboots the entertainment industry is fatally addicted to because they don't have people talented enough to actually continue a story from its last set of circumstances. Hollywood resets stories because the people they hire don't have the talent to tell new ones. The 2000s Masters of the Universe was a reboot of the vintage storylines, and as we've seen, the upcoming He-Man and the Masters of the Universe is a reboot, and the Masters of the Universe revelations that was promised to be a continuation of the 1980s cartoon has proven to be a reboot as well. So it probably won't surprise you that the Masters of the Universe Classics mythology was also a reboot. The Classics mythology was a clumsy attempt to combine all of the disparate storylines and toys into one universe. And it aped all of the previously established canon and transformed it while simultaneously disregarding it. Most reboots, like modern Star Wars and Star Trek, have earned these achievements as well. But only Masters of the Universe Classics has been able to claim itself the winner of Fan Wank Bingo, because it landed the final category. It's a category that modern writers endlessly flirt with in our brave new world of self-aware writing, because these creators always want to be meta. But usually, they never reach the final summit of Fan Wank Bingo for a number of common reasons reasons. Sometimes it's because they just know they'll never get away with it with the audience. Sometimes it's because even their egos aren't massive enough to allow them to cross that bridge too far. Sometimes it's because they know the parent company is actually paying attention and wouldn't allow it. And sometimes, with a few creators, it's because they know such a move makes for guaranteed and rarefied levels of awfulness. 
Don't get me wrong, they dance with this dragon dangerously. J.J. Abrams infamously said he designed the characters and plot of The Force Awakens as a wish-fulfillment story that was intended to convey the flavor and experience of what if Star Wars fans found themselves in the Star Wars universe? The film was terrible, the characters were ciphers, history will have its justice over this manure fire. Ryan Johnson made it clear his character of Rose Tico was specifically conceived as a person that shouldn't be in a Star Wars story by any measure, much in the same way Johnson himself shouldn't have been a director of a Star Wars story by any measure. In both of these instances, Abrams and Johnson are telling us they created other characters as surrogates for their own personalities. Rather than having the creative ability to write within someone else's sandbox, they are incapable of seeing a situation or narrative as apart from themselves. So they created Rey and Rose respectively to allow themselves a place in their Star Wars films, unconcerned that these characters assisted greatly in breaking the credibility of this mythology. But you know what they didn't do? As bad as their decisions were, they didn't literally put themselves into the story. They had just enough shame, a baking sheet thin amount of shame, I grant you, but just enough to not put their literal selves into the production. The marketing manager of Maddie Collector, who was in total control of Masters of the Universe classic story development, did not have that crucial baking sheet amount of shame. We could talk for six months without stopping about the film industry's inability to find stewards for legacy properties. We could talk endlessly about how guys like Abrams and Chris Chibnall and Zack Snyder don't know how to be stewards. How they don't protect these modern myths and their only reflex is to hijack the material to satiate their self-absorbed personalities. How they run with bad ideas because bad ideas that are theirs are always preferable to good ideas that come from someone else. The marketing manager of Maddie Collector didn't just prefer his own ideas for Masters of the Universe, he preferred his literal self in the story as one of the most omniscient and powerful characters of the narrative. This is thin, Riggs. This is very thin. Is that right? It all began when marketing manager Scott Knightlick decided to take advantage of his position to put his own face on one of the Eternian guards in the Classics figure range, and in the background name that character Left Lieutenant Specter. Nightlick then writes into the story that Lieutenant Specter is exiled into the future after Skeletor takes over the throne of Eternia. In the future, Specter is given a special time travel suit by King He-Man. Jesus. Before we even attempt to unpack the whole time travel suit thing, how on earth is He-Man the future king of Eternia if Skeletor was victorious in the past? <laughs> Also, why is he King He-Man and not King Adam? And if He-Man is king in the future, that somewhat undercuts the urgency of doing anything about what has transpired in the past, right? Has Nightlick even seen Back to the Future? Somewhere in the past, the timeline skewed into this tangent. Anyway, now Lieutenant Spectre is the mighty Spectre and fights for the king and queen on special missions throughout the time-space continuum as the master of time travel. Superhero landing. So, the marketing manager of Masters of the Universe Classics put his face on a character and then wrote that character into the story as a pivotal ally of He-Man, entrusted by the King and Queen of Eternia to time travel to crucial moments to ensure their victories over the forces of evil. Let that sink in for a moment. Jesus. Let's consider that it wasn't enough for Nightlick to put his face on a figure. That could have just been an Easter egg and we'd all chuckle and move on. <laughs> but no, he had to make the character a pivotal member of the Eternian heroes with the word mighty in his moniker, the word master in his background, and someone given the power over time itself. Once you have the power of time travel, the story is broken. And while I know He-Man has always been a very loosely played high fantasy with occasional time travel plots, we are going back in time. This character's existence breaks the entire story. In reality, no one can go back into the past. 
Someone like Zodak would have shown up and dealt with him and King He-Man for breaking the rules of the cosmos and likely punishing them into oblivion. And let's say Zodak didn't care. Why is this battle still going on? Why didn't the mighty Spectre go back to when Keldor was a child and just murder him? Hell, why didn't Spectre prevent the death of King Greyskull by stopping Hordak's entire existence? Oh right, because then there wouldn't be a Masters of the Universe franchise. Erased from existence. See how characters with stupid, omniscient powers like the mighty Spectre break a story? It wasn't enough for Nightlick to foist this character into the classics mini-comics. Nightlick also connived this character into full toy production for the 30th anniversary wave of classics figures. This was a toy line that was only available by online subscription, and many of the core original characters like Tila and Trapjaw had been out of production for years by 2012. These essential figures were in high demand and selling for obscene amounts of money on the second-hand market. However, rather than have a few of these sought-after core characters re-released for the 30th anniversary, Nightlick and his team of geniuses decided to instead make a wave of concept figures, such as Fearless Photog, a figure a kid designed for a He-Man contest in the 1980s that Mattel never got around to making. And right smack in the middle of that assortment is the walking purple nurple known as the Mighty Spectre. Because the final insult to all of this is that Spectre is Nightlick's childhood drawing. It wasn't even a character conceived in the inept fervor of his story meetings with Mattel during the Classics era. No, this was a character he'd drawn with crayons and loneliness as a child in the 1980s. Because I've got young children and I have to lie about paintings a lot. Because their paintings are so shit, I can keep it. Yippee! I'll put it on the pile. Nightlick's forced insertion of Spectre into Masters of the Universe wasn't by happenstance. It was a whimsical childhood fantasy of wish fulfillment that proved to be a long gestated campaign, culminating in Nightlick cosplaying his own derivative narcissistic work of fiction at San Diego Comic-Con that same year. All he really wanted was for people to notice him. But what good does it do to be noticed if people don't like what they see? In the toy industry, the EGOT would be getting a figure that looks like you, getting a figure you create, and getting a figure named after you. And eventually, over the course of 10 years, I actually wound up doing all of that, which was crazy, like not expected. Not expected. You were the guy in charge of everything at Maddie Collector. You gave yourself the Oscar. You're like the guy that's supposed to be looking for the new host for Jeopardy that then made himself the host for Jeopardy. You can look back at Michael Bay's Transformers and see how Hollywood has an incessant history of hijacking legacy ideas. Heck, you could even make the argument to a certain degree that Masters of the Universe suffered a bit of that with its own 1987 film, though most of that was down to budget and technological limitations. It tasted good. Not Transformers, not Star Wars or Star Trek, not even Doctor Who had a person take the helm and literally make it over in his own image to the degree Nightlick did. Nothing comes close. Nightlick is his own greatest hero in his own mind, and he wanted all of us to know it. You're not a f hero. You're just an annoying clown dressed up as a sex toy. This is a man that named himself Toy Guru on the internet, and spends most of his time these days telling toy collectors how they've got it all wrong, and how he's the only one with the real answers about the toy industry, and how he's the smartest guy in every room he enters. <laughs> Nightlick stole, allegedly, a Masters of the Universe fan's well-known idea for an unnamed character in the vintage poster art during his time as marketing manager of Matty Collector. This unnamed pilot was given the nickname Sky High by prolific Masters of the Universe fan Joe Amato. Do you mind telling me who the mash man is? Nightlick ganked the name off Amato's posts on He-Man message boards, allegedly, and used it for the classic figure. When Amato called Nightlick out for it, Nightlick Nightlick claimed it was a nickname given the character by the fans. When Amato corrected him, Nightlick promised he would set the record straight at the first opportunity. To date, Nightlick has said nothing.
In quietly failing to do so, Nightlick paved the way for Mattel to steal allegedly fan ideas whenever they wanted. Most recently, Amato was the victim again. His beloved custom beast for Faker, named Copycat, was stolen allegedly by Mattel for their recent spate of PowerCon exclusives as an Origins 2-pack, renaming the beast Duplicat. Mattel claims to have had no knowledge of Amato's prolific customs of this concept. Allegedly. But unfortunately, Mattel reps in previewing the PowerCon exclusives kept referring to the set as Faker and Copycat. Oops! And that's not rumor. That's from the mouth of the PowerCon organizer himself. And then I went to Mattel and said, hey, you know, just so you know, there, there, there's this awesome customizer named Joe Amato, and he made this version called Copycat, and a lot of fans know about it. And, you know, I am worried that when this comes out, fans might think that you got the idea from them. You know, is there anything we can do? Is there, can we throw Joe a bone or whatever? And they said, no, we, we came up with this. You know, this is, this is something we did. Then the, Dan Daniel. did an interview <laughs> with yeah. some of the guys from Mattel, and they started calling Duplicat Copycat. And I was kind of like, oh, that's that's made me kind of like uh, just bite my lip quite a bit because I'm like, that's not the kind of thing that really cements absolute faith in, in the fans when they're, you know, they're hearing Joe's customs name being used rather than the one that they created internally. In, in, in our community, you can't not know about copycat and you can't not know have joe have done it so yeah two of the biggest voices in masters of the universe fandom failed to challenge mattel and protect a fan val staples of he-man.org and powercon and pixel dan himself when he conducted the interview i remember one year at powercon i was there and i saw how many people were making you know their own versions of it i've definitely seen like fans do versions of that over the years and then when we came up with the cat we were like let's make a copycat okay so duplicat is actually the name right i think that's the name that was on the press release how can you call yourself a fan advocate and a member of this community in good faith when you won't even challenge the parent company when they're allegedly stealing a fan's work and don't tell me that they didn't know. Val already admitted he knew, and Pixel Dan is just as big in the community as Val Staples. This isn't a failure or lapse of judgment on Val and Pixel Dan's part. It is willful avoidance to maintain good relationships with Mattel at the expense of their fellow fans. You know, that takes care of any concern or legal stuff. And I was totally cool with that. Val, what is that short for? I'm not, Phil, I lied. Courage means having principles and sticking to them, no matter what. So yeah, Mattel is taking pages out of Nightlick's playbook and robbing the fan base allegedly to compensate for their own lack of talent, and then lying about it allegedly when caught. Nightlick is a man fatally out of touch with the toy collecting world, and deliberately deaf to the experiences of the normal people in the toy aisles. His responses to these issues of poor distribution, low production volumes, and rising prices are typically corporate in their attitude and rationale. He tells us to disregard what we see and not listen to what we hear. He tells us what's good for the corporation is good for the consumer. And why wouldn't he? Nightlick has always been about himself and his own ambitions. He couldn't care less less about the average collector in the toy aisle. This is a man who is desperately trying to curry favor with the big toy industry to take him back. And he's got plenty of time on his hands to make his appeals. Because when you can't even stick it out at Loot Crate, all you've got is time. Nightlick would have you believe your experiences in the modern toy aisle aren't what you think them to be. That all of this is excellent for the toy companies, therefore you as the customer should be grateful. And over the years, Nightlick has taken every opportunity with toy industry promoters like Val Staples PowerCon to push that message of obedient consumerism. Val Staples and guys like him are willing agents of toy industry representatives like Scott Nightlick. You know, you want to see what he looks like with uh, Lieutenant Spector's head? I just happen to have a Lieutenant Oh yeah, that's right, because you just carry yourself just... in your pocket. This is the danger in getting too chummy with big toy companies. You can kiss objectivity goodbye with a lot of these personalities, and before you know it, they're selling you the same messages as Nightlick. So make no mistake about the relationships between people like Val Staples and the toy industry. Like, they are f <laughs> The rapid sellouts of product, the terrible distribution, 
the exorbitant costs, turning the toy collecting hobby into an online game show where you're always praying you'll be the first one to hit the buzzer before the item changes in seconds to sold out. These are long-standing issues that can be mitigated, but rather than do anything about them, the companies do nothing. And what is Nightlick's recommended solution? Well, uh, they said they'd be grateful. Be grateful, Nightlick says. It's not what you think. They learned that bad things can be made to look good. But the thing is, Scott, it is exactly what we think it is. And why we should always be careful and question everything that doesn't seem right. Your spin of these issues doesn't solve the problem. Paint rust any color you want, it's still rust! Companies have to sell products to make money. Nightlick acts like these businesses do us a favor by making anything at all. If they didn't make products, how long would these companies last, Scott? This isn't a consortium of toy-loving millionaires that do this action figure thing for fun. When your default position is to defend the companies that no longer employ you, there's a fire somewhere because I can smell the smoke. What it boils down to is this. Scott Knightlick is one of the major players responsible for putting the mainstream action figure industry in the terrible place we find it today. If the stories are to be believed, a lot of them coming from Knightlick himself, Knightlick was one of the major torchbearers for premium-priced online-exclusive figure lines. He had a hand in convincing the brass at Mattel that He-Man and Ghostbusters wouldn't sell at retail. As soon as he was gone from Mattel, Ghostbusters figures were in stores again, while Super 7 took over the Masters of the Universe responsibilities. Sadly, the damage had been done. Mattel lost the licenses for Ghostbusters and DC Comics in rapid succession to competitors. And today, Hasbro has Ghostbusters back on store shelves, and McFarlane secured the DC Comics license for retail pegs. Oh, sure, one man can't be solely responsible for the machinations of multiple companies and business realities over the course of 20 years. But it takes a village, and Nightlick was a major influencer in that village over important brands for several years at a crucial time. So yeah, Nightlick bears a measurable part of the responsibility for the direction the toy industry has gone. Despite this online sales push, Masters of the Universe Classics figures started showing up at retailers like Big Lots and Toys R Us, and I'd love to know what the brass at Mattel thought of that. It wasn't long after these events that Maddie Collector was shuttered by the parent company. According to Nightlick, he left of his own choosing. However, behind the scenes, it was clear they'd had enough of the many customer complaints about Maddie Collector, and probably just as many about products like Nightlick's Mighty Spectre and Molar the Eternian Dentist. And let's not forget, it was Nightlick himself in the aftermath of his departure that acknowledged online the amount of negativity being thrown at Maddie Collector by customers, and Mattel had had enough. Nightlick didn't go quietly, as he continues to tout his former Mattel credentials to this very day. I still remember the day. Not the story. But true to form, he never put any of the onus for the decision to shut down Matty Collector on the corporation. Instead, he blamed the customers. He blamed them for being negative and implored them to maintain blind positivity toward corporate product lines, despite the many frustrations with terrible quality control of the figures themselves and egregious mismanagement of the purchasing process from an outsourced third-party company called Digital River. Specifically, Nightlick blamed a blog called Nefty's House of Rants that was being read by less than 50 people for the demise of Matty Collector. He blamed a blog, a tiny blog, not the suits that actually control such decisions, not himself for Masters of the Universe going to Super 7 practically on his watch. He blamed a fan blog. It's an unprecedented low in an era where corporations shaming fans is commonplace, and arguably the only thing worthy of a trophy that Nightlick has ever accomplished. That's Nightlick's entire modus operandi toward customers and collectors. Be happy and settle for whatever you end up with. Don't ask questions. Don't demand better. Just buy the next thing offered. Be positive toward whatever corporations do at all times. Be happy in your work. As for the mythology of He-Man, Nightlick claims Revelations is nothing but awesome, and everything's a different universe, so it's all good. He also claims these new shows aren't made for us. That tired argument. 
disregarding the fact that Revelations was marketed as being for us. Nightlick's claim that it's a different universe and therefore totally cool goes back to what I said earlier. When you have no talent, you reboot. Rebooting and retooling requires no thought and very little skill. And most of the time, all you succeed in doing is breaking what other people proved worked like gangbusters. Rather than build on these stories, and in doing so, get new viewers interested in the entire narrative history of the franchise, talentless hacks like Nightlick slap the multiverse label on the pig and grab a lot of lipstick. By starting over constantly, it dilutes the appeal of every iteration of the property. Doctor Who took the opposite approach and hasn't relied on multiverse strategy to change directions. Yes, at present, the series is suffering under a lame showrunner, but the 2005 relaunch of the series is, to this very day, still following off the past 58 years without narrative multiverses. Taking the opposite approach with Doctor Who brought in a whole new audience for the franchise itself, and increased interest with young people in watching the original classic episodes, because the new show was a direct continuation of the original series. You cannot achieve that by jumping into your own multiverse so you can tell whatever story you want like Nightlick did. Using the multiverse approach instantly cul-de-sacs the mythology. Create too many of these multiverses and you end up like Masters of the Universe and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Franchises that stay just popular enough to keep making uneven relaunch attempts, but where all of the goodwill remains with the original iterations. Originals that the property owners are unwilling or unable to revisit visit and continue because they won't pay the various royalties out to the parties involved. Saying everything is a multiverse is the equivalent of saying working within an established narrative framework doesn't matter. And yet the original framework resonated with audiences and made it super popular. Changing it and just calling it a multiverse is a road to ruin. Great stories become great because they were carefully considered and built upon, resulting in bastions of renowned fiction that make sense within their own rules and earned massive amounts of credibility with the public. Multiverse theory undermines the importance of solid world building and logical storytelling in film and television. Right now, we're watching the Marvel Cinematic Juggernaut begin to buckle under the multiverse ideas that cracked the foundations of the MCU the moment they were introduced in Endgame. Time doesn't work that way. Changing the past doesn't change the future. No! <laughs> what? The DC television and film productions have never fully gotten their feet under them with audiences thanks to the multiverse approach to their strategy. And Star Trek is a dumpster fire due to the multiverse approach. But Nightlick will never see this differently. He's a guy who created a character for himself based on his own self-deluded fantasies of omniscience that travels through time. In doing so, he always knows exactly what to do to win the day. At least, that's how Nightlick sees himself. He broke an entire universe just so he could place himself and his hackneyed ideas within it, and then go play dress-up as his He-Man character at comic conventions. And when pressed about how he and others like Kevin Smith have damaged Masters of the Universe, his response is that it doesn't matter because it's all multiverses anyway, once again disregarding and dismissing the experiences of his own customers. I said before in the Game of Clones video that Generation X's spate of filmmakers have woven a disappointing legacy in which they habitually display an attitude of ownership rather than stewardship for these famous properties when given the keys. Nightlick is one of the worst examples of this. He's the poster child for an ego that can't get out of his own way. Everything has to be about him, his alleged knowledge, his alleged experience, his claims of superiority over toy buying collectors. All right. Of course, it's always about you, isn't it? He had to put his face and his childish ideas into Masters of the Universe. Nightlick did not demonstrate stewardship during his time at Maddie Collector. He exploited his position and took false ownership of the franchise. And the saddest part is seeing the comments online from people that forgive him this and admit that if they'd been in his position, they'd have been tempted as well to do what he did, take advantage of their role to inject themselves into Masters of the Universe. These are members of our generation giving Nightlick a pass because they admit they couldn't restrain themselves either. And that's sad. 
Very sad that Gen X has that dysfunction. Our peers in these positions have all but admitted they don't know how to be stewards to protect these stories for future generations of children. Those put in charge have hijacked these stories for their own adulation. In doing so, they've managed the past 15 years to hold them hostage for our aging generation, making the stories edgier and darker with each year that passes. So much so, they've effectively created a rift between the stories and the child audience for which these properties were invented. And Scott Knightlick is the worst of us. For all of his corporate speak claims that present incarnations of Masters of the Universe aren't made for us, despite what the marketing literally said, Knightlick remade He-Man's story quite literally for himself. He helped convince Mattel that He-Man was no longer appealing to kids, making it an online exclusive premium product line and charging high prices for the privilege. Then he put himself at the center of the story, a story he wrote for himself and no one else. How dare he have the mendacity to claim Masters of the Universe isn't made for this audience or that audience when he went to such unfathomable lengths of ego to focus the entire experience on his own very personal interests? Telling fans Masters of the Universe wasn't made for them while very much acting like Masters of the Universe was made solely for Scott Knightlick. And eventually, over the course of 10 years, I actually wound up doing all of that, which was not crazy, like not expected. Let me put it another way. If Nightlick was Battle Cat, he'd never go on an adventure because he'd be too busy licking his own anus and enjoying the smell. And I'm sure by now, Scott is already making his case to tell me why he's not responsible for the failure of Matty Collector and had no hand in the quandary the toy industry is in right now. That's textbook Nightlick. Take all the credit for the things that worked, deny all responsibility for the failures, just like a seasoned corporate sociopath. Remember, this is the guy who loves to call himself the toy guru, loves to tout how he has all the answers, and how his perspective is unique and more experienced than everyone else's, how he is an influential force in the toy collecting world, until you highlight the results of that influence, and then suddenly Nightlick isn't to blame. If you aren't responsible, Scott, then you can't simultaneously claim you're the toy guru that's the smartest, most important guy in recent toy history. Heavy is the head that wears the crown, and you keep putting that crown on your own head, but you can't just wear it only when it suits you. If you're as influential as you claim, you can't defer responsibility when it's inconvenient. So which is it, Scott? If you're not responsible by any measure for the situation toy collectors find themselves in today, then you weren't really that influential in your years at Mattel. And you need to stop talking about yourself like you're the second coming of Elvis. But I need to tell you something about all your skills. As of right now, they mean precisely dick. But if you still insist you're the hottest shit in the room, then you need to start adopting some class and finally take responsibility for your own failures and the resulting precedents you set for the toy industry that we're living with today. And you could start by apologizing publicly to Joe Amato. If reality truly is a multiverse, it must have taken a lot of bad luck for us to have ended up stuck in the same one as Scott Knightlick.